this slide, is the projector going to go on? The projector I'm going to need in the middle of the talk sometime. today in the same style as I did yesterday, meaning that uh, I'm not going to talk about any work I've done, I'm just going to talk to and tell you a little bit about some current work in this field of granular materials to illustrate uh, what directions people are trying to, to go in. Uh, and so again, I will always fall back to the position that I'm not an expert in what I'm telling you, but I think we have a more expert in the audience. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you about is uh, a story that's based on the following papers. a statistical component to this granular system. If you look at the pattern of states, they're kind of random, and if I shake the system, I get some other state, and uh, you might hope, nevertheless, to be able to describe at least some aspects of behavior by some statistical means. And experimental evidence that you should be able to do this, you know, there are experiments, people in classic experiment done by the Chicago group, where they take a column of granular particles and they vibrate it at some particular frequency and amplitude and then stop and let it settle, you know, it relaxes to some height. And then if they do it again, it relaxes to the same height. 
And if they change the frequency and amplitude, it will vibrate and then settle to some other height. And then they can change the parameters of the vibration back to what it was before, and it will relax back to the height it had before. So there is some reproducibility and uh, consistency in things you can measure. So this has led people to try and make statistical ensembles to describe what's going on. Uh, but before I tell you about that, it's worthwhile to remind you a little bit about how you develop ensembles for just equilibrium statistical mechanics, because we're going to do the same thing. So uh, let's just quickly review how you go from the equilibrium microcanonical ensemble to the equilibrium canonical ensemble. And this is something uh, Royce alluded to I think, in the first talk. And so what's the steps in the microcanonical ensemble? What you note is that the total energy is conserved. And then if you were to do a calculation of some observable quantity in this microcanonical ensemble where you have a fixed value of the energy, then there are many possible states in the system that have that fixed value of the energy, and you just average over all of them with equal probability. Okay? And uh, so you say that all the states of the same energy are equally valid. And I remind you that that's an assumption which you never really prove in statistical mechanics. You just assume it to be the case. The system is so complex that uh, the trajectory just sweeps out every possible spot on the constant energy surface. But that's an assumption and that's proven to be tested against you know, lots of real life experiments to see if it works. Uh, And then if I have n variables in my box of volume V, if I fix the total energy to E, I can count the number of these states that have that total energy E. And then you define the entropy. Which is the log of the number of states on both of this one. And then the temperature. What should I do? Move it down? That no, you, you were too near to that. Turn what down? I don't see an odd. So the problem is you were too near to this thing. Too near? Oh, okay. Are we coming over to the right? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So then you define the microcanonical temperature as the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy, and that's the microcanonical ensemble. Then, if you want to go to canonical ensemble, what you do is imagine having a big system, which is the reservoir, and then you imagine your little system, which is what you're interested interested in, and you assume that the system of interest is connected to the reservoir by some membrane which can transport heat. So let's go with the top thing. Yes. So the word ensemble here enters in the fact that you assume the time average equals ensemble average. Because so so far there, there was no need to talk about ensemble except for that for that. Uh, well, I didn't mention anything in time. Uh, I guess the justification for this by saying that the means are all equal is that the time average of the two 
a death rate, scoops out of these cars and it costs them to service. Right. And then, that's you, the, and then you equate it to the ensemble average, and that's where the ensemble is, right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I, mean, I, I just tell you what you do. Why don't you just start with and the ensemble? You whether that's really the same as the time average is something you have to really test, right? It's not proven. Uh, okay. All right, so that's our system of interest. That's the reservoir. The total energy of the combined system of system of interest plus reservoir is conserved. And is additive. Okay, that's a key ingredient. So the total energy the energy in my system of interest plus the energy of the reservoir. Okay, and clearly there's a correction because of the interaction between the two across that boundary, but that's a surface effect compared to a bulk effect and it goes to zero. These systems are beginning. Uh, a reservoir is a reservoir because it's much bigger than what we're interested in. So that reservoir has uh, a much bigger volume than the system of interest, many more particles than the system of interest, and its energy is always assumed to be very much bigger than the energy of the small system of interest. The next key thing you say is that I'm looking at the number of states of this combined system, which have the total energy Vt. What I can do is factor that into the number of states of my system of interest that have a particular energy E. And the number of states of the reservoir that have the particular energy E reservoir, which I write as Vt minus E. And then I should sum this over all possible values of E, which is the ways to distribute the energy between the two. And this factorization is another key ingredient in making this all work. It's just telling you that uh, if I have so many states here and so many states here, that the way to get states of the total system is to pick one from here and one from there, and they're independent of one another. So this assumes Interest is statistically independent of what's going on in the reservoir. There are no correlations that affect that. Uh, and then finally, when I look at the number of states of the reservoir, since the energy of the system of interest is very much small compared to the total energy, I can expand that. And the way I'll expand it is not by expanding omega directly, but expand its log. So I'll write this as like that, just doing a linear expansion in the log of omega one the entropy. And this then, this is just a constant because E total is fixed, and the rest just becomes E to the minus E over T, T reservoir. Right? Because the derivative of the log of the omega with respect to energy is the temperature as defined in the micro ensemble. that uh, the temperature of the system is the same as the temperature of the reservoir. 
So this then is just the same as e to the minus e over t, where t is So I'm just sketching it. I'm not putting it every step. And then the final step is to say now that the probability my system of interest will be found to be in some state with some particular energy E. That's just proportional to the number of states of the total system, which have the system with energy E. So that will go like omega E, omega R, E, T minus E, which goes like omega E, E to the minus E, T, and that's of course to give its distribution. Okay? So that's the sketch of how to go from microcanonical to canonical ensemble. The key Features are you have an energy that is conserved. You have additivity of the energy over subsystems. And the number of states or the density states factorizes the two subsystems. Those are the three ingredients. Okay. There should be also like an implicit assumption about the functional form of omega r, right? Because you're assuming that it's better to expand the logarithm than omega r itself. Right? Yes, I suppose. But most systems do assume it's okay. Okay, so the goal now is to see if we can do the same story uh, for a granular system. And if we want to try and do that for a granular system, uh, we can't just do this because energy is not a good quantity to use. It's not conserved. Uh, and we're at zero temperature. Okay. So, the first idea of what to do was given by Sam Edwards some while ago now. And what he said was, Look at my look at any particles in a box of volume V, <coughs> and that has so much free volume, that's the empty space left in the box. And that's a conserved quantity. Doesn't matter how the particles move around, that free volume is still the same number. It's also additive over subsystems. Okay, if I split the box in half and I add the free volume here and the free volume there, I get the free volume system. Okay. So it suggested to him that this was a good quantity to build a statistical ensemble out of. Uh, so what does he do? Uh, This ensemble is intended to apply to rigid particles, which can't be so compressed, because if they can squeeze into each other, free volume would not be conserved anymore. So this is for rigid particles. And then particles in the volume V, we have a certain number of mechanically stable configurations. Mechanically stable is what I said yesterday. Force and balance, the force and balance on every particle except for two radius. And so I can count uh, the number of such distinct mechanically stable configurations and call that omega. And then what he did is He 
Here's the key assumption. Assume just like you do in the microcanonical ensemble for a constant energy, assume that all of the mechanically stable configurations of the n particles of the box of vitamin B, that they are all equally likely, meaning as I jiggle the box and let it relax, or jiggle the box and let it relax, I will equally likely sweep out all those mechanical and stable configurations with no particular preference. And then if you do that, then I can take the log of omega like an entropy, take its derivative with respect to the conserved parameter V, and that gives me a temperature by quantity called X, and X is called the compactivity. Steve we were discussing that a little bit before. I think it's worth pointing out this cannot possibly be a time limit. This really is always an ensemble energy. It's an yes. initial condition. Yes. yes. Uh, 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 ah, what Ugo just pointed out is that looking at it this way, everything here is truly an ensemble average. It's not a time-dependent average because each one of those mechanically stable states by themselves would just sit there forever. Okay, so I have some other thing which is jiggling me and taking me sampling the configuration. This is not the natural time evolution of the system. Okay. All right. So that's the compactivity. And then we proceed the same way as we did over here, except all the E's become V's. And if I imagine I have my, here's the box now. And I focus my eye on some little segment of that box that contains some number of particles and ask what's the probability that the free volume in just this little section of the box will be some value. It will look something like that. Uh, probability to have and that state in that small subsystem of the box would have a free volume of V2. Okay? And the compactivity will then distribute, determine what's the distribution of these uh, free volumes in different so the independent subunits of the box. Uh, yes? So now you really careful, I said, okay, so these mechanically stable states are the same as the positions of the particles, yes. and the particles are distinguishable, or you know, what are the things that you I don't think we're going to, we can say they're distinguishable. There's no quantum mechanics here. So the particles are distinguishable, and... Question? What kind of barrier do you have between your... Oh, now there's no barrier. This is just your mind's eye making the little... Well, okay, so what I would probably do is say, take out a, a set of M particles, and then I'll have some way to tile the space to a lot of the area of the space of the particle, and I can count up how much is the volume of those M particles. And I can do that for different groups of M particles at different places in the system. Okay, so that is Edwards' uh, ensemble. And whether it really works or not, you know, this is a question still of contention. Okay, there are some experiments which try to measure it directly and have various degrees of success. There are some experiments which try to infer it indirectly and have various degrees of 
of success. There are some simulations coming out uh, fairly recently which are trying to argue the case that this is not right at all. Uh, but uh, there you have it anyway. And uh, as with all things in statistical mechanics, the real test is, you know, does this really predict what goes on in an experiment or not? And one has to just see that. Okay. Anyway, uh, even if the Edwards ensemble should be okay in certain applications, yeah. Is, is there any kind of thermodynamic limit buried in any of the assumptions here, or are you assuming a finite size system? Uh, I guess I'm assuming that the system is big enough that I can look at a small subsystem, and that small system system itself is big enough, and the rest of the system is even so much bigger that I can do all this. So I don't know mathematically what the right limit is, but you're certainly assuming large systems. Yeah. Okay. He, yes. Is there a lot of the zero log thermodynamics? Uh, I don't know. What is the zero log? Well, the systems can be there at the same temperature, and this is an equivalent with another system. So that K and C are. Yes, the idea here then is something like this. If you had two systems and you stuck them together, they should equilibrate to have the same compactivity on either side. Yes. That's no, if I take another system. Another that system. Also has, that also has the same compactivity as the reservoir. Yes. Does it mean that this and this have the same compactivity? From this theory, yes. The theory would be yes. this data. Yes. And that's one of the... And so there's one recent experimental work by Karen Daniels in North Carolina doing something similar to that. She has a system and she's got a wall and she tries to measure how it equilibrates and her claim is that none of this works. So I, I, I think hers, I, I won't say that's the final word, but people are still looking at this and it is not a resolved question. But even if it was okay, what I want to say is that the Edwards Ensemble is uh, of use uh, only in certain situations, particularly for rigid particles. Okay? Uh, if they're not rigid, free body is not conserved. Uh, it's also only of real interest if the particles have friction. Because if the particles are frictionless and they're rigid, then the only jammed states are at that single packing fraction, the jamming fraction, or if they're spheres, the random close packing fraction, or whatever you want to call that fraction with a gem up. I can't compress them any further, and they're not jammed below that. So there's just that one one point, and the compactivity there is, I think, got to be zero. Uh, so it's really only best for systems of frictional particles where I can have jamming, even for rigid particles. If they're frictional, I can have jamming over some window of packing fractions, and then I can get, uh, you know, finite value of the compactivity that vary with the packing fraction and so on. And if you want to see some of that, you can look at this paper by Maxi, which was the last paper I mentioned in yesterday's talk, uh, where he does that for spheres uh, with complete range of friction coefficients. Okay. So. Um, okay. So what we want to do now what kind of ensemble we could make that would allow us to describe uh, frictionless soft core particles, the formable, the formable particles that can squeeze into each other. And uh, this is going to lead to what's known as the stress ensemble. Okay, so 
what's the stress ensemble. Let me just to have a simple concrete example, imagine I'm talking about spherical particles. And these spheres have some soft core interaction, which means that if the separation between two particles, Rij, is less than the sum of the radii of the two particles, they will repel some force law. It doesn't matter what right now. And otherwise, if they're not touching, they don't interact. Okay. And at this stage, we can allow this set of spheres to be monodispersed. The radii can uh, be different. Uh, okay, with that, the interaction energy of the system is just the sum over all pairs of their interaction potential. The potential depends on which pairs we're talking about because the particles can have different sizes. Yes? Okay. Potential is, goes like Rij? No. Uh, you're right. That's a bad notation. It has some functional dependence on R when the particles are touching, namely the separation between the two centers is less than the sum of the radii. That's all I mean. You can take this to be so any form you like. All right, the energy is then like that. Stress tensor, you can write like this. Can people see down there? Yeah. Okay. Write the stress Lambda L by lambda L, 
and then take u uh, dv, you understand, you get t. And so you can again do a really good for all coordinates, put that form of the energy, you'll get this out. So it does. Okay, let me just write one more thing. If the system is under isotropic compression, all the diagonal elements are equal, and then I can also write the pressure 1 over d times the trace of the stress tensor. And the trace of the stress tensor is just Let me take the dot product between those two terms. And because we have in the simple example here uh, spheres, the contact force is always normal, so it's in the same direction as the separation. And we can then just find this is a scalar. Like that. Okay. So that's the pressure, and we'll use that later on. Okay. Question? Yeah. Yeah? Was there something about IJ? IJ is all pairs of particles, yes. And so I'm confused as to why, maybe I'm missing something. Why is the pressure different from 1 over D times the stress tensor? Where is the trace? The trace is here. So I'm just summing up the diagonal elements. Each diagonal element is P. So when I do the trace, I get D times P. Right, so I'm looking at the definition of the stress tensor sitting up there. Yes. Oh, I put the one over D here. Right. That's what are the indices in your stress tensor? Ah, oh, okay. I'm confused. Okay, yeah. What's right. the question? Oh, there's a dot product. There's not one upstairs. Right. This is a tensor. Okay, yeah. And this is a trace. I missed the dot. Right. All right. Oh. Okay. If the scalar F is the gradient of minus the gradient of that case. Okay. But I believe uh, this is actually a completely general situation for even if they're not spheres and if the contact potential has no simple center to body interaction. This one remains. Okay. Okay, then we can define just the total force moment tensor for capital sigma. That's just the stress tensor times the volume. And so that's just one half. Some pairs R I J F I. What we want to do is we want to prove that this stress tensor is conserved and it is additive over subsistence. That's the goal. Okay, so we have a little algebra to do, but keep in mind that's where we're going. Uh, let me rewrite that a little bit. Let's say here are my spheres which are touching. That's Rij from I to J. Let me call Dij the vector from the center of I, this one is I, this one is J, to the point of contact with J. And so Dji would just be going the other way. And so I can write Rij as just Dij minus Dji. And then I can substitute that into here, and I can also use Fij as minus Fji, that's Newton's third law, and substitute that in there, and then what you'll wind up with is just sigma is the sum from I to J, Dij, Fij, like that, 
Microscopic stress tensor of brain I. And the total stress moment tensor is just the sum over all the brains. Okay. And I can also define the total uh, stress tensor, you know, force moment tensor over some volume V by just adding up the stress tenses of all the brains that are in that volume V. Okay, that's definition. Okay, now the current. Right. Right. So, you thought this was complicated. There's this carefully color coded picture with all the colors are not even known. What we want to do is prove that sigma is additive over some systems, which sort of you already see here. And then what we want to do is prove that sigma is a conserved quantity. And what I mean by a conserved quantity in this case is that the value of sigma for some fixed volume only depends on the boundary conditions. If I make any local rearrangements of the particles within that volume, it does not affect the value of sigma at all. Okay. So, what we're going to do is the following. Here are some cluster of grains. In this case, it's generally not spheres. Here's grain I, where we want to focus our attention. And this derivation is in 2D, where it works out nice and simply. In 3D, it's much messier. But the main point here is that in 2D, the voids between grains are well-defined objects. So let me label the grains with Roman letters, I, J, K, L, M. The voids I will label with Greek letters, nu, nu, lambda, tau. And we're going to define a height function, H, that lives at the center of every void. And the way I'm going to define the height function is the following. H i nu minus H i nu is equal to minus F i j. So let me uh, find out. So what I have in mind is sit at some nu and then move counterclockwise, counterclockwise to the next void over, which in this case is mu. And the difference between H on these two sides is just related to the contact force that separates this void from that one. Okay? And the same as you go around. Okay, so H I mu is going to be H. Okay, we're also going to fix our starting point to some particular value, which is arbitrary. And so then I can say H I mu is H naught minus F I J. Yes. H is a function that we are defining that lives on the centers of the voids. Okay, and I am telling you how to construct H now given the contact forces and the geometry. Right? So what I'm saying is we're going to pick H here to be anything you like. It could be zero. 27, uh, whatever you like. Uh, it's like a vector potential. It's exactly. Yes. Uh, and then if I know what H is here, I just go over there, and this law tells me how to compute H at this void. Now I want to go to the next void over clockwise, which is here, and I want to compute H over there. H I lambda is then H I mu minus the contact force that separates those two points, which is this one, the force between I and K, F I K. And so that's H I mu, we'll put in there, H I mu is H naught minus F I J minus F I K. Right? 
then we can go on. So, can you tell me what the physical significance of this plate function is? Oh, why <laughs> <is it> not? <laughs> and why we would not refer to it as equal to zero? You can. You are certainly free to set h not equal to zero. You certainly may. And what is the you know why we wouldn't do that? And what the physical Oh, some people don't like zero. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> why, why should I impose my case on you? You choose whatever you want. Well, I'm just wondering if there's a physical No, physical no, no, no. Sure. So as Ulrich pointed out, what we're really doing here is very similar to constructing a magnetic vector potential for a magnetic field. And you know the magnetic vector potential also has, you know, unspecified things you can get to it without changing any physical properties. So it's very analogous. Okay, now we want to go here. H how? And that's H I lambda minus the contact force that separates that, which is I to L. And then the other board, H I lambda is just H naught minus I J minus I K and now minus I L. And if you pay attention, you should know where I'm going with this, right? Finally, we come back to side new over here. I'll do the same thing. This is just A I L minus A I M. And then plugging in for I capital above it, H naught minus F I K minus F I K minus F I L minus F I tau. And the point is, all these forces do what? They add up to zero. Okay, because we're always having a mechanically stable state. And the forces on that plane I have to sum to zero. So what's the point is the point is that when I do this construction going completely around grain I, I come back to where I started and there's not any funny business going on. Okay? And that's specifically due to the condition of mechanical stability of this set of rings. Okay. Uh, so now I can write my stress tensor. for grain I like that. And for the F's, I can use my height fields. And so, and okay, that's FIJ here. It's the height fields on the two voids that on the sides of that contact force IJ. And now I can just break this up into two sums and relabel the other one to write this as the sum on mu. Uh, sum of J matter, sum of whatever. DIK minus DIJ HI mu. Okay, so I just shifted the names of everything to get rid of the H mu and call it an H mu. And then this thing here. DIK, that's this vector, minus this vector, DIJ, is just the vector which takes you from one contact point to the other. We'll call it GI mu, HI mu. And then what I want to do is convert that sum not to be around here, but to be around the area that grain I occupies. So what I can do is connect the centers of all the voids surrounding that grain by vectors like this. And of course you see T plus S is equal to G, so it's no cost just to write this as like that. And so what does this done? This transformation to this field H, it's enabled me to write the stress tensor of this grain I 
as something which is a sum around the boundary of the area enclosing that green eye uh, involving only the height field on the boundary. All right. Now, when I want to sum up and get the stress the force moment tensor over some collection of grains, what I do is I just add the up around the boundary of each grain. So I go around this, and then I would want to add on that one. So I would go, you know, go with that. And what you notice is that on internal voids of this larger area, when I sum up these terms here, it cancels when I go this way around I and this way around J. And so all that's left when you have those pan line cancellations is a sum around the boundary of the volume or the area in this case that you're interested in. Okay, yes? Is this one thing you have friction as well? Uh, I don't believe anything here used the fact uh, that this was friction. I don't think so. Yeah. It only works because all the forces on every grain has to do zero. Okay. Yes. And that's nothing. We didn't assume the forces were, well, in the picture, I do the forces normal, but I don't think anything here says they have to be. So, and then what about the redness? The what? The redness. The Redless? The Redless. The Redless. The Rattlers. The Rattlers. The Rattlers. The Rattlers. Okay. Uh, we just don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, the touch Well, we'll just rattle them off so they're not touching. <laughs> No, no, it's a different kind of okay. number. Let's well, measure how they touch, but then you talk, then you bring in a time leverage. No, no, no. 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 The true. point is that really, in any mechanically stable position, those rattlers are not really exerting a force on anything. Because that would be unbalanced. So, yeah. so it's okay. Okay, let me go more quickly now. I have. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. All right. So the point here is two things. I, I mean, this has demonstrated the two properties that I claim, namely that the stress tensor for some uh, region. This proof was in 2D. One can make a more complicated but still correct proof in 3D. The stress tensor for a volume just depends on the boundary. So no rearrangements of particles inside will ever affect that. So if I have a system and I fix what the boundary conditions are, whether they're fixed or even if they're periodic, the stress tensor is conserved. No local rearrangements of particles will ever change it. So sigma tensor is conserved, and moreover, sigma tensor is additive. Uh, by the same thing, you know, if I had... <coughs> Two subsystems. V was V1 plus V2. The stress tensor of V is just the sum of the stress tensor of two. So this now lets us make a statistical ensemble where sigma is the quantity that plays the role of energy or volume in the Edwards ensemble. All right. Okay, so, uh, again, for any particles in a box V, of volume V, uh, you will have different mechanically stable configurations, and they will have different values of this force stress tensor, and I can count how many configurations have a particular value, and call that omega, and then Assert in the same spirit as was asserted before that all these mechanically stable states which have the same value of the stress tensor are equally likely to be found as I jiggle. Okay. So we're debating the system. So if I have the system not, you know, arrange things very nicely, yes. the stress tensor will go down. Yes. I want to take the system and I start shaking it. Yes. Because I want to go from this particular point to the other one. Yes. Really quite yes. Now, how do I know that the stress on the boundaries? I'm not shaking the system off because the same is going to happen. Or do I not have 
Well, if you shake it, if you shake it in a way that leaves the boundary atom and this particle the same, then you know. If I imagine, because they haven't moved despite the shaking. If I had periodic boundary conditions, say, and shook it in some way, it's still a case that you need some coherent global rearrangement of particles to change a signal. And you can do that. But any kind of local kind of things that's just going to move things randomly, locally, won't do it. It's sort of, in a periodic system of periodic boundary conditions, it's like a topological kind of quantity. That's the final. Oh, well. Okay. All right. Let me go ahead. So we count the number of states, and then we can take the derivative. with respect to the stress tensor, and that's now a tensorial derivative, so what I get is a tensor and this is called the angoricity tensor. That's a name given to it by Edwards. Uh, as a simpler limit, tensor, just use the scalar gamma, and then 1 over alpha is the log omega t gamma. That's the scalar angle. Quick, quick question. Yes. Sorry, if in the notes, what you've written here is inverse alpha, it's just called alpha. Uh, you're absolutely right. This is alpha. And there's no inverse over there. The point is, alpha inverse is the inverse. All right. So now, uh, once we have all this machinery, we can now go to a canonical ensemble, just like we did before. And here's my box, and I focus on some small subsystem there, which is some connected cluster of n particles. And we would guess that the probability for that m particle cluster to be in a state new is just goes like e to the minus alpha times the uh, gamma of that state. So, okay. We're now at the point where we can actually compute something. Can I borrow five minutes from my question? Okay, so this is all very nice formalism, if it works. Uh, but we want to try now to compute something. And I hope I can get it. Let's write the partition function for that m particle cluster, which would then be the sum over all states nu of e to the minus alpha gamma of nu, right? Nu is a state of the particle cluster. Gamma of nu is the value of e times v for that cluster. And
What I mean by a state nu is some specification of the positions of those particles and some specification of the contact forces on those particles. So I can write this now as the sum over all particle positions, the sum over all contact forces, e to the minus alpha over 2 sum on ij, r ij, f ij. So what I put in here is just the expression for the pressure. Yeah? Like we had as many black holes ago. And then what I have to include is some delta function which doesn't allow me to sum independently over all f and all r, but just those that satisfy force balance. And then I have to put in another delta function that tells me these forces are related to the positions via the force law of the soft core potentials. And so I have those two delta functions constraining this sum. And now what we're going to do is not worry about computing that everywhere, but just worry about it at the isostatic point where the system first jams. And at that isostatic point, Remember, that was the point at which the number of unknown force, contact forces was just equal to the number of constraining force balance equations. And so if you know the R's, you know the F's. Or conversely, if you know the F's, you can know what the R's were. So we can get rid of the delta function by just summing now over forces. I'm going to eliminate the positions and write this as E minus alpha over 2, sum I j, r i j, which is a function of the forces as determined through the force balance equations, f i j. All right? And now, in general, this looks messy because I don't know what those are as a function of f's, but I do know at the isostatic point. Okay? Because at the isostatic point, the particles are just touching. They're not pressing into each other. And so, just to make life simple, I'll assume all the spheres have the same radius. All the Rij's are just 2R. Because the particles are not pushing into each other. So this then is the sum on Fij e to the minus alpha over 2 sum on Ij R is 2 so we get rid of that R Fij and now, of course, you see that all the forces have decoupled. Alpha, 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 alpha. Sorry? Is that alpha R? Alpha R, yes. Not a two. And so I can now decouple the sums, make a product over all contacts, integrate over F, e to the minus alpha R F, and just evaluate the partition function, 1 over alpha R to the number of contacts. And how many contacts are there? There's N, Z iso over 2. All right? And so now, we can do a few things. Uh, From this expression here, Q, that partition function, I can find that the average uh, P times V, the average gamma, is just minus D log Q, the alpha, similar to all the previous So if I do that, average gamma is minus D log Q, D, gamma, what I get is N, Z, iso, 
Alpha. Two alpha for alpha is N Z iso over two. That's the equation of state. Tells me how the angularity is related to the average gamma of the system. Uh, I can find a also, using that alpha was defined as d long omega, d gamma. That's how we define the angularity. I can integrate that to get omega by gamma n z iso over 2. Okay, so it grows by gamma to the power n. Yeah? And so the probability that my subsystem of n particles, at some point, change from n particles to n particles. Clear. This goes like omega of gamma e to the minus alpha gamma. This goes like gamma n z iso over two e to the minus alpha gamma. Okay. And so here are some predictions about how things should behave at the isostatic point. If you're looking at the distribution of uh, pressures, P times V, over clusters of particles in my box. And there has been some numerical work testing this out. And within the protocol they used to make their jam states, it seems to work. Uh, one last thing to point out. Uh, from over here, and over here, you can see that the probability distribution for having a particular value of the force on a contact, that goes like E to the minus alpha R F. So it's an exponential distribution of contact forces at the isostatic point. And that's an issue of some, still some controversy. People have measured this experimentally. People have simulations measured this. And what one sees is something that looks exponential over some range of forces. But then as you get to the high force tails, uh, it seems like it might be departing from that. And whether that's an issue of poor statistics in the high tails, or that this really is an exponential, this is still, I think, an open question. Okay, so I've used up too much time and I will stop. Thank you. So, how do you have a problem with this uh, system that I don't understand? Can you speak a little louder? Sorry, I usually have a problem that I don't understand here. So, suppose you even take the simpler example of just gelation. So, you have an infinite cluster, right? Yeah. And then you have subcluster, and you yeah. try to find the shear modulus here yeah. from the uh, scaling and so on. Yeah. Particularly in 2D, you're plagued by the problem you have excluded volume, and you have the subclusters which cannot rearrange because of the presence of the infinite cluster region. Yeah. So you see a lot of local variations in your, you know, a lot of disorder yeah. effects. Yeah. So this is actually slightly you know, worse because you have yeah. a rigidity perturbation which yeah. is stronger and you yeah. of course have smaller yeah. systems and this assumption that things should be arranged and you, are, you can yeah. sum over all ensemble seems yeah. to be a really yeah. harsh assumption, right? Uh, I have the same word. So okay. I can't argue with that. Next, you want to say anything to that? I have the same word and I'm not sure. Uh, and the only thing I can say is the fence is comparing it against some simulation data. It seems to hold. But I have the same one. I have some language question. Where does the angle recipe come from? Oh, is it, is that a kind of sweater or something? <laughs> 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 no, that's the, that's the city that sells those sweaters. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I think that that is a more serious discussion. No, it's just a comment, but uh, I wanted to worry. Einstein got the same concern about the time averages used in their industry. He felt like that was something like that. Ground. Yeah. I don't
understand the, the statement that capital sigma is conserved. Um, okay. So imagine like taking some small piece of the system yeah. and, and rearranging the particles so yeah, they're very like in, in a crystal so that they, they don't touch each other. So then yeah. if they don't touch each other, then well, we don't know that you can do that necessarily. Well, like if you take, you know, a hundred particles, then you'll be able to do that, right? I don't know if I can do that and still have force balance and mm-hmm. obey on every part. I'm going to do that to show you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I still rearrange things and wind up in a mechanically stable state at the end. That's what I have to have. And so the point is that as long as I left the boundary atoms alone, it doesn't matter what I do to those things. As long as I am in a mechanically stable state, this stress tensor cannot have changed. Yeah. I have a question about the additivity of the stress tensor. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that you're only considering additivity between two subsystems and one larger system. Yeah. Is that that's true? Yep. So it wouldn't hold if I took two separate systems into their own box and brought them together and I took the wall between them away where I still had additivity of the stress tensor. That's kind of the thing that we do in equilibrium. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Right? I mean, that. Well, when you put them together, I can forget that they were ever separate, right? I suppose, uh, as long as I wait until after I took that wall out, they reform to be one big uh, mechanically stable system again, then still I think I would find that the stress here plus the stress here was the stress of all things. I don't think there's any But the question would be, if you call it one system A and one system B, yes. would the stress in A plus the stress in B be the same as one system A? Oh, not necessarily. Well. No, the system has to occur. It's just like if I have T1 and T2. Right? Well, or E1 and E2. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. I think the idea is it should be. But, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so if you, if you remove the boundary, I mean, if this isn't an isosceptic, you're going to create some softness. And just by removing the boundary, it's not necessarily true that the other side of the boundary is going to be perfectly aligned so that you don't have the softness left. Yeah. So you have to do that, you know, very fine-tuned alignment of all the particles to get back an isostatic whole system. Otherwise, you'll have some problems. Yeah, so how, how you join them? is a subtle thing to be done carefully. Yeah. Maybe it's a, shall we reserve questions? I can't speak to that. Two minutes left? Okay. 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 Equation for the pressure. pressure. Yes. Um, from the form of this equation, the pressure is expressed as a sum of something. The sum of something. Yes. But actually, pressure is the intensive sum. Uh, yes, and this is divided by the volume. I think in the last term there's a d missing, but otherwise it's okay. I have the sum on i j. But since the number of contacts J to each I is finite, that sum scale like the volume, and I divide by volume, and that's intensive. Okay? Yeah. Well, they are, or they're negligibly. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you my concern about this isostatic point. This isostatic point is really special. In fact, it's supposed to be like a critical point where the correlation length is infinite. So how is any little subsystem independent for the rest of the system? I don't know. So I, I yes, I worry about it. Okay. Well, the answer I've been given to that question is that if you look at the contact forces or if you look at the pressures, even in the isostatic state, 
no correlation function you would measure would ever reveal any long-range correlations. They look very short-range. And therefore, maybe those quantities don't care. But I don't know. Uh-oh, the internet turned out. Well, maybe we'll reserve the other questions for a final discussion. Thank you very much.